Good evening, everybody. My name is Bert Dicht. I'm Managing Director of Membership for the National Space Society. And on behalf of my colleague, Larry Ahern, Vice President of Chapters, welcome to our Space Forum this evening. Space Solar Power, the future is here. Again, welcome. It's been a couple of weeks since our last presentation, and we thank you for joining us again. We hope you're going to enjoy tonight's presentation. And I always like to do a little bit of prep work before we get into the program, a little bit of the virtual etiquette related to the questions, a few NSS announcements, uh, what's coming up in our space forums. We still have a little bit more work to do to get more programs online, but we'll be sharing that with you. And then we'll get right into our program for the evening. So we did get quite a few questions that were submitted beforehand. Uh, when you registered, so we're going to be using a lot of those, but to submit a question as we go through the presentation, uh, feel free to use the Q&A function. That's best because it can be seen directly by the panelists, and it doesn't have all the other discussion that might be in the chat, but it is okay to use the chat. I only ask that you be respectful of the panelists and the audience. What we're going to be doing tonight is a little bit different than our typical presentation, so we'll probably open up early uh, if you want to ask a question live uh, over the uh, microphone, so we can be able to do that for you as well. A few announcements, a uh, reminder about our ISDC 2023 and New Space Age, the International Space Development Conference is coming up very fast. Uh, May 25th to May 28th at the Embassy Suites in Frisco, Texas. You can see a number of sessions on the moon, space settlements, interplanetary infrastructure, space development, the many roads to space, Mars, and, and many more. And we've got a great list of featured speakers. More are being added every day. Uh, I will put this link into the chat. So if you want to register, I just registered myself this week and look, I'm looking forward to the ISDC. So hope to see you there. Uh, and if you do have any questions about the ISDC, feel free to put them in the chat as well. As always, we encourage you to give to our cause. If you're enjoying the programming like this and other space forums, uh, please donate to support NSS. We appreciate all the support you've given us uh, in the past, and we look forward to future uh, your future contributions and your future support. So we thank you for all of that. And uh, again, I will put this link into the chat as well. And finally, in terms of just the main announcements, uh, please be sure to complete the post space forum survey. It only takes a few minutes. It'll pop up right after the session ends. It's completely anonymous and the feedback truly helps us with our planning and also coming up with better ideas, better execution for all the future events we hope to have. So we thank you in advance for giving us your input. What's coming up? We're not going to do a session two weeks from tonight. Uh, that's kind of a holiday week. Uh, and the six would be between uh, Passover and Easter weekend. So we have decided to wait to the 13th of April. And we're going to be doing an ISDC town hall. So we're going to be previewing what's coming up for, at the ISDC. We actually hope to have several out. of the speakers there uh, who will be able to share a little bit of an introduction to what they'll be talking about at ISDC. And on the 20th, uh, a brand new book called The New Guys by Meredith Bagby. Uh, it's about the 35 uh, shuttle astronauts who were picked in 1978. Uh, it's a fabulous book. She had great access to uh, many of the astronauts and great personal stories. So I encourage you to be there. We'll be giving several of the books away as door prizes. And I've put this list up before. We are working and getting a number of these individuals lined up. Uh, you'll be hearing more about that uh, as we move toward uh, the ISDC. So that's coming up. What we have for tonight is a really exciting program. And space solar power, the future is here. And I'll introduce our panelists for tonight. We're going to be doing this a little different. As I said, it's not going to be full presentations. Uh, our panelists are going to do some introductory remarks. 
And then we're going to go right into the discussion and questions. And we want you to be part of that dialogue. So our first panelist is uh, Gary Barnhard. He is president and CEO of Extraordinary Innovative Space Products, uh, uh, Sp Space Partnerships, sorry about that, Incorporated. Uh, and John Mankins, uh, founder and president of Mankins Space Technology. Both Gary and John are longtime NSS members uh, and involved in both sides of what we call this, you know, the space solar power world on the advocacy side of NSS, but also on the technology side as engineers. So I think you're in for a good treat uh, and you're going to enjoy the session. So please be feel free again to ask as many questions as you want. Uh, and we're going to have a great dialogue. So with that, I am going to stop sharing and turn this over to start off with uh, to, to Gary. Gary? Okay. I can get my uh, share on here. You should be able to see the screen. It is starting to share now. There we go. Perfect. Fantastic. Okay. I'll sh well, in terms of you know my involvement with uh, space solar power, it stems you know back from um, you know uh, the the mid '70s with respect to the L5 Society from an advocacy standpoint. But there's a basically a problem, you know, in that era in that um, the world with respect to space solar power as a viable system was sort of the equivalent of having to accept the Mad Hatter's. Uh, advice or actually the Red Queen's advice about how many impossible things you had to accept before breakfast. There's a little thing like we had to figure out how to build large space structures, figure out how to live and work in a space environment, a few problems that had to be addressed. Uh, decades later, uh, you know, we, you know, well, we had um, you know, what was cast as the great debate on the business case for space solar power. Uh, in uh, December of 2008, and I made the perhaps rash assertion that there is something real that could be done right now with respect to the tech, at least in a space-to-space -space venue. And not far from that, uh, the surface-to-surface -surface venue on the moon, and that that could help require retirees at least, uh, you know, uh, perceived, if not real, cost schedule and technical risk with respect to moving forward. Uh, with a, uh, you know, space to earth, a uh, space solar power, uh, you know, program. The, um, uh, you know, not being one to be like, liking to be wrong, I decided I had to uh, put some engineering where my mouth was in those regards. And this chart here uh, basically shows the arcs of the different venues from, you know, the initial ground testing on earth through space to space, through space to surface to surface on the moon, space to the moon and or asteroids and in space to earth. And the idea is that there, there are real things that, can, that are being done in each of these areas that can be leveraged. The, uh, you know, starting off with uh, you know, what we proposed with respect to the International Space Station in terms of comparatively short range power beaming and much smaller assets to activities uh, associated with the um, uh, robotic prospecting uh, you know, on the moon uh, to uh, actually um, going through and beginning uh, you know, initial processing plants, all of these being customers for power and really extending the notion that uh, you know, power and ancillary services beaming is not just um, one scale, it's part of the overall uh, you know, distribution tools that we need to be able to bring to the table. And what we're really talking about um, is how you, um, uh, you know, build the lunar power and light company uh, and extend that uh, to uh, bring the table, bring to the table options uh, for space to earth applications. There's a detailed, uh, you know, present extended presentation that'll be available, uh, you know, after this talk that you're welcome to look through forward and on to John. Thank you, Gary. Uh, and if I could uh, share just briefly. So um, speaking about, uh, let's see if I can do this. 
got to find the right spot. There it is. Okay. Um, I'd like to just take a couple of moments uh, and Gary, raise your hand if you can hear me. Very good. Your thumbs are okay too. Um, so just a little background on where things stand with regard to space solar power. There are a variety of different ways to do space solar power that have been developed, invented, discussed, studied over the past 45 years. Going back to uh, what's characterized here as type one, back in the 1970s, um, the first round of studies at NASA and the then very new Department of Energy in the US, uh, the 1979 reference system concept after Peter Glazer invented the idea of the solar power satellite in 1968. Now there are a range of other concepts that are being considered. There are active programs in China, uh, in the um, uh, United Kingdom, in Japan, uh, and now uh, most recently in the European Space Agency. Um, there are um, uh, activities in the US targeting um, military applications of space solar power, not commercial applications of space solar power. And as Gary alluded to in his remarks, there are um, a significant uh, number of applications of high levels of power for the development of space resources and the development and settle, uh, settlement of space over the coming decades that can only be enabled by significant amounts of power. And space solar power is one of the options for achieving that. Um, there is currently and I think this will come up in the questions. There's currently no um, US program for commercial space solar power, but there is a great deal of interest in the application of space um, power, including both space, space nuclear and space solar for in space applications. So um, there has never been a moment when space power has been more accessible and more achievable. Uh, and there has not been a moment when it has been more needed um, or for which the benefits might be more clearly uh, demonstrated. So I think Gary and I are both very much looking forward to this evening's discussion. Uh, the questions that have been submitted are terrific. Uh, and we look forward to uh, Bert's moderation of the, of the um, the next uh, 48 minutes. So thank you so much and, uh, and let's get to it. Great, thank you for the introduction, Gary and John. Why don't we start with just a simple question because just in case some people aren't aware of what space solar power is, can, you, can either of you give a kind of an elevator speech as to what is space solar power? John, you want to go for it? Okay, so space solar power is a really simple idea invented by Peter Glazer after the, uh, the advances of World War II and the Cold War in the 40s and 50s in terms of technologies. It basically takes systems to space, harvests solar energy where the sun shines all almost all the time and then deliver it safely, efficiently and affordably to markets here on earth. Uh, and, and by doing so, making possible avail the availability of literally thousands of megawatts of solar energy wherever we want it across the inner solar system. So that's space solar power. In a nutshell, also we, um... When you look at it in terms of the context of the contemporary problems uh, that we face, if you want to power uh, you know, uh, cities and industries, there's this notion of baseload power. Right now, for large-scale baseload power, we have a very limited number of options that are on the table. You've got large-scale wind, water, and solar, which you know, 
we should do whatever we can there. Uh, we have what amounts to being, uh, you know, nuclear fission, which has, you know, its own profound limitations in terms of, you know, both the lack of fuel and what you have to deal with to, you know, reprocess the waste to be able to get the fuel to keep using the things. Uh, you've got the notion of clean coal, which some might argue, um, you know, is an oxymoron, you know, uh, out of the gate. Um, and, um, you know, you can, there's, you know, you can do peak shaving with things like, uh, you know, natural gas, but that's, um, that's about, that's about it, except for space solar power, which represents something that is scalable to a level that could uh, be make an extraordinary difference, not just to meeting the electrical energy demand of the United States, but the growing electrical energy demand in the world. Uh, and, um, you know, it's not a panacea, but it's something that could make a tremendous difference in the mix, should we choose to bring it to the table. I remember giving a talk way back when I was in college. I took a a uh, public speaking course and I did a talk about the space program and I mentioned space solar power. I don't know, this was maybe 1978, 79. <laughs> now we're in 2023. It's something we talk about for an awful long time. What has been the holdup? What, ha what, have, what have the obstacles been that have prevented us even from creating a pilot type of system? There from a United States standpoint, there's the question of who wants to be responsible for it. Uh, there is the question of, you know, as I alluded to earlier about, um, you know, the perception that there's some number of impossible things you have to accept before breakfast uh, in order to, uh, you know, realize it. The bottom line, though, is it's a complex systems engineering problem, and it's a complex economics problem. So um, the, the, another way to approach that question, Bert, is money. Money, money, money. Always so comes down to that. <laughs> using the technologies that were available in 1975, when the first round of studies got started, the cost of the first kilowatt hour, getting to that first kilowatt hour from a space solar power system that would have used the technologies of that time was about one trillion dollars. Now, as a potential energy barrier, I'm a physicist, as a potential energy barrier, that was insurmountable. And so it got it got laughed off the stage, so to speak, as a as a viable option for terrestrial energy, and then only was revisited 15, 20 years later as new technologies emerged and as new opportunities in terms of the system concepts became plausible. So it, 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 the first time around when you were in college, I assume you were in college, yeah. uh, although it, maybe it was grade school, who knows? <laughs> uh, it, it was not really practical from a financial standpoint, even though it was established to be technically feasible. The, uh, uh, Go ahead, Gary. Uh, a way to think of it is, is that the things that have changed uh, at a fundamental level are uh, one, uh, you know, the idea that you can build things that could fly to space that aren't an art project, uh, where you can uh, radically reduce the amount of hand tooling that's required and be able to produce things, you know, on a quantity basis as opposed to a one-off or small number basis. Secondly, uh, the, um, uh, the idea that you could bring down launch costs dram you know, uh, dramatically uh, you know, it represents you know, uh, uh, a fundamental transformation in terms of what's possible economically. So the, those two things plus retiring you know, uh, you know, you know, any any number of, uh, you know, uh, you know, no, you know, uh, notions well conceived or not about what is or is not possible, um, you know, have led us to the point now where the number of impossible things we have to accept before breakfast is actually zero. Right. 
why don't I get to a few of the questions? Because I, I do want to come back to some of just the the progression we've made, but uh, I want to make sure we get a few questions answered. And I did see a hand up, but it looks like the hand went down. So if you do want to raise your hand, uh, that's okay. Okay, a couple have raised their hand. Let me just ask this question that came in uh, when people registered. Uh, you know, what is what do you see as the most important technical challenge right now to maybe demonstrate that first build, that first uh, a space solar power system? John, you want to take this one? You're muted, John. Yep. Thank you. Uh, so my opinion on this is, is rather different than the, than the run of the mill. Everybody who gets involved in space solar power, the first thing they want to do is try well, uh, Raytheon Corporation, a wonderful friend now, now passed, Bill Brown, demonstrated wireless power transmission with high efficiency on the Walter Cronkite News Hour in 1963. So from the standpoint of physics and engineering, there's always advances, there's new devices, there's new techniques, there's all this, but the wireless power transmission is the least of our problems. What I think is the, is a, is the, uh, is the technical challenge that we have to solve now that low cost launch is on the horizon, the near term horizon, now that device efficiencies and advances in component technologies are really well in hand, the number one thing that in this technical and mental is it, perception is building remarkably huge structures in space using robotic systems. We have to be able to get past the barrier of a thousand tons or 10,000 tons being unthinkable and and actually start thinking about it so that to me that's that's the number one challenge and um, the work that's ongoing uh globally on in space assembly and and the orbital um, structures and all that that's all terrific but they have to be stupendously huge by comparison to the biggest thing we've ever made the international space station very yeah, I, I use slightly different words. Um, I uh, call it, uh, in a sense, orchestrating. Uh, what's needed is orchestrating symbiosis, shared control between humans, robots, and advanced autonomy that's going to enable uh, you know, the, uh, the work that John was describing. Great, thank you. Uh, let me open it up to a couple questions. People have raised their hands. I don't want them to have them up too long because they, they'll get tired. So I will let them talk. Jeff, I'm going to let you ask a question. So make sure you unmute yourself. Yep, you're still muted, Jeff. Jeff, you there? Glad it's not just me. <laughs> <laughs> the technology. Well, let's tell you what, let me let uh, Aiden ask a question. Jeff, we'll come back to you once you're able to unmute. So I'm going to let uh, Aiden ask a question. So I'm allowing you to talk. Aiden, you'll need to do the same thing. You need to unmute. Oh, we're having trouble there. There oh. he is. Oh, there's Aiden. There you go. Uh, can uh, nuclear fission, fusion, and other forms of energy production coexist with space solar power? If so, how? Thank you. Well, the short answer to that is yes, but the question comes in is what's the venue uh, and what, may, you know, what makes the most sense? Uh, from an economic standpoint, you know, there's precious few things that could make Earth launch space solar power seem reasonable price wise. Nuclear raises it raises the bar to meet that challenge. Uh, if you look at what the current costs are for putting bringing on a new nuclear you know, power plant, um, there is the hope of uh, 
compact fission. Uh, and there is, you know, fusion has always been somewhere between 20 to 40 years away uh, since I've become aware. Um, you know, the, uh, it, where I think it does come into play, particularly in the space environment, um, you know, on uh, uh, this, you know, on the moon, we may have, um, you know, uh, nuclear systems uh, require heat exchangers, heat engines. So do solar dynamic power systems. Uh, so there's certainly some um, opportunities for interoperability, uh, you know, in, uh, you know, with air. So um, if I may just to um, offer a, uh, an additional thought on this subject. So um, absolutely space or ground terrestrial uh, PV energy sources. The opportunity with space solar power is to have a, an affordable, dispatchable, renewable, i.e. carbon net zero uh, energy source, because a solar power satellite can deliver power to any place on the ground that has a receiver that it can see. So unlike other, ter other energy uh, options, other power plants, uh, like a, a nuclear power plant uh, in uh, uh, California or a, a terrestrial solar plant in Spain, they can only deliver power locally within the limits of the existing power grid. But a solar power satellite could deliver carbon net zero energy at an affordable price. This morning in Chicago, this afternoon in Hawaii, and overnight in South America uh, from the same power station. So it's, it's uh, really a remarkable opportunity to have an affordable dispatchable base load energy option that could work in concert with all the other options on the, on the ground. We're still seeing, okay, we're still seeing if Jeff can talk, he's not able to yet. Uh, so we'll come back to him hopefully in a, in a, in a short time. He, because questions have come up about nuclear, other aspects, I'd, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, how people view sustainable energy today. Uh, you know, you've got, you know, you've got huge solar farms that take up an enormous amount of space. Uh, you've got uh, the wind, you know, wind farms, which nobody wants in their backyard, for example. And each of those have, you know, they're providing energy, but there are environmental aspects to them as well. Uh, in terms of space solar power, uh, you know, John, you mentioned how big these might have to be. What do you see as any, you know, we want to get, we're going to get clean energy, but are there downsides from an environmental standpoint or is it all plus? Yeah. So, so just to, just to tackle that first, um, I think there's, there are issues to be resolved. There are questions to be answered. Um, how these systems would be launched, the environmental impacts of the launch of the systems, how quickly extraterrestrial materials could be introduced to mitigate launch uh, impacts. Those are all legitimate questions and they have to be carefully considered. But I think that from the standpoint of carbon net zero, i.e. sustainability, as it's looked at as a, uh, in terms of, of a modern contemporary policy issue, space solar power is practically unbeatable. The energy return on energy invested is on the order of 99 to one. The payback time in terms of the energy for manufacturing and launch, because it's 24 seven, independent of climate, independent of, of, uh, of season, independent of weather, because it's 24 seven, 365, except for a little bit of time in the, in the spring and the fall, Space solar power has the opportunity to pay back the energy investment cost in about six or seven weeks. And, and there is just nothing else in prospect over the coming decade that could, that could get even close. Um, and so I think the, um, 
um, I think it is pretty close to an unmitigated good with the exception that we have still some issues that need to be resolved, like the environmental impact of launch or the, the, the potential environmental consequences of the wireless power transmission, things that we believe are minimal, but which have to be proven to be minimal. The interesting irony is, is that space solar power has to prove its efficacy in a sense with, you know, uh, by tying both hands behind her back. Uh, okay. In that, you know, the way to, the, the way to do it is to launch everything from the earth. Okay. You want to get away from that as soon as you possibly can. Okay. But, uh, you know, the, this is also a situation where, we have to, um, uh, you know, this, this can't be sold as a panacea. Right now, energy sources at any given place that you're, you're after power, there's a range of different solutions that make up how that power is made available uh, to the grid that you end up making use of. The notion that space solar power is going to change that overnight, okay, um, you know, is, you know is, isn't going to happen, but it is, the notion that you have a system that is so scalable, okay, that it could make, you know, make a difference very quickly and then can be taken much further is of, uh, you know, extraordinary value to bring something like that to the table. It's a, again, you're right. It's a, it's, you know, we are expecting it to be a, you know, turn a switch and all of a sudden everything's going to be settled. But as you're both describing, it's, it's uh, incredibly complex and it's going to take some time uh, even to, you know, to get there. So uh, what, I, what I think is actually the biggest, you know, once you, once you get past the, the technical problem, you know, the, you asked earlier about, you know, obstacles, there used to be, it's the $10 billion check, okay? And my response to that was, it doesn't take $10 billion to start retiring risk, real or imagined, okay? So let's start doing something real with the tech. I think we work it from both ends. Uh, and, you know, when, uh, you know, and it's, you know, it's something that we can, that we can build on. It's not trust the men, uh, the, the the men and the women in the white coats. It's actually let's look at the real, uh, you know, the real economics of the situation. What are the right systems to build? Uh, okay, um, you know, to meet our needs. It's not can you do it. It's can you make, can you can you do it right? So I got to I got to quip, Gary. Uh, forgive me. You said it's not the men or the women in the white coats. Those are the ones who are coming to take us away because we believe. <laughs> true, true. That, well, the um, yes, John, you're um, you're you're quite correct in that re that reference was a less than veiled, uh, you know, play on uh, you know uh, you know Doctor Demento's uh, jingle there. Uh, let me just interrupt the discussion real quick. I know there have been some discussions uh, in the chat about the microphones, uh, where the mic icon is and how to unmute. And uh, I know I, I provided an answer and a few other people provided an answer. It, it really depends on, I guess, the type of computer you're using and how you've gotten into the platform. Uh, I've always seen the microphone icon either at the bottom of the screen or the top of the screen uh, as you move your cursor. And some people are saying they can't find it. Uh, so I'm gonna, you know, uh, I'm gonna ask if if uh, Fred uh, Becker, our tech guy, can maybe take a look in what options we might have for people who aren't able to find their microphone icon. So, uh, and I'll check into this also because I've never had a problem on any type of system I've used so but I want to make sure some people can are able to answer the question if you can't find your mic feel free to put your question into the chat or into the Q&A so let me get back to one of the questions that was asked uh in in the registration and John you mentioned about all the countries that are doing studies with space solar power and back at the ISDC in 2022 in Washington a NASA official uh, made an, an announcement that NASA was looking into 
space solar power. And they hadn't done this in a very long time. What's, ha what's happened with that? Has there been any progress with that? Oh, you're, you're muted, muted John. John. Thank you. Thank you for the, I didn't do it. Thank you for the question, Bert. Um, so I think that the, in the context of the answer, in the context of my introductory remarks, so there are active programs now underway to develop space solar power, multi megawatt level solar power with wireless power transmission in this, in cis lunar space in China, in Japan in the UK, in the European Space Agency. There are research programs, not yet policy or, or programs, ongoing in government and in industry, in South Korea, in uh, uh, Australia, and other, other places around the world. There are ongoing programs in the US, which are both academic at Caltech, and for military applications only, which is really rather different at the Air Force Research Lab, there is no program in the US. NASA said uh, 12 months ago that they were gonna start looking at it because of all this momentum. Um, and so far, and so far nothing. Um, I, I think the fundamental barrier in the US is that NASA doesn't work on energy for Earth, and DOE doesn't work on space other than nuclear. And, and so for commercial applications, civilian U.S. commercial, there is a gap, not the, not the, the, the chasm of, uh, you know, the, the valley of death in terms of a technology maturation effort, but there is a problem with the structure of the US government in terms of who has responsibility for what. And nobody has responsibility for this activity. Um, and, it's, and it's really hindering the US from moving forward. It, it, the way it worked in the 70s, there was a partnership between NASA for space and DOE for, for energy and together they could have a space solar power program. But, but as the way things stand right now, and that was dictated by the way, by the Congress, the way it stands right now in the absence of legislation, in the absence of White House policy, nobody has the ball. And so, and so the US is just standing around looking at it and, and lots of people know about it and all the rest of the world is <laughs> China, Europe, Japan, and so on. They're all moving forward with it, and the and they're all planning demonstrations in the next four, five, six years, major demonstrations. And the only one who's going to be not even working on this technology and this system concept that was invented in the U.S. is going to be the U.S. There. John, is there a recognized leader right now? Who who would you say from a from a global standpoint is leading in the concept of space solar power? Um, from the standpoint, well, it's clearly at the moment, it's, it's, uh, it's a race between Japan and China. It's in Asia. Uh, it just no question. But in terms of the technologies, the technologies are all over the place. So I expect Europe and the UK to move forward quickly. I think that any, if Australia or South Korea wanted to move forward, they could move forward quickly. This is not like fusion. Gary alluded to fusion earlier. This is not like fusion where some fundamental 10 or $100 billion investment in research has to be made. The research is done. The physics is known. It's engineering. And, and it's, uh, um, so, so the, but the lead today, the lead is in Japan and China. And what we need from a U.S. standpoint is how do agencies that have legacy positions that uh, you know are they're different they're difficult to walk back from, okay that they've taken in the past. How do you go through and create some form of interagency fora where someone steps forward before there's a an approved program to allow uh, and involve, 
an evolving set of positions from NASA, DOE, Department of State, and get you know uh, you'll get the get the ducks in a row there. Uh, you know you're not going to have a um, you know a a new program until the different agencies involved figure out how they can you know in, embrace that possibility um, and you know have it make sense for them. Do we need a space solar power X prize? Would that be something that might spur uh, the uh, the concepts? So I I'd like to to speak to that. So I was I was involved last year in the um, in at the X Prize Foundation effort to formulate future X prizes, and they recently came out with a report from last year's activity. It was about four weeks or six weeks ago, and space solar power has been identified as a candidate X Prize. Um, I think the so so there's a there's a uh, an opportunity there, but the 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 issue is how much money to accomplish what, by when, and then what's the follow on? There, the, to have a successful X Prize, you've got to have a, a sponsor. You got to have a, a prize defined. You've got to have a sponsor who's willing to write the check, the foundational check, and then you've got to have a future business case to to make it work. Um, but that, but the the idea that you articulated, Bert, that is on the table already. Okay, great. Let me get a few questions that have come in. Uh, a number of people of uh, let's see, raise their hand. Uh, Jim, are you available to speak? I can, add, you know, you're you're able to talk right now. If you wanted to ask a question, but I don't know if you can unmute or not. Which, but you look there you go. Look great in your helmet. Okay, Jim, go ahead. Yeah. I, oh well, well, uh, thanks a lot. Um, not sure I had a particular question, but uh, enjoyed the conversation uh, a lot. You know, John, um, I think you're, you know, you make some really poignant points about uh, where the United States is in the game, and <clears throat> I think the opportunity is so huge in front of all of us um, that it really it really does make us uh, scratch our heads as to what can we all do to accelerate uh, the entry points into the game um, what would you what would you see John as the uh, main ways to accelerate US involvement either commercially or governmentally into space solar power so I, I would just say that when we when we when we brought space solar power back in the U.S. in the 1990s, it was because, or it was a result of congressional leadership and White House support. The congressional leadership came from a Republican, Dana Rohrabacher, in Southern California, and the White House was a Democratic White House. Steve Isakowitz and his team at OMB in the Clinton White House. And there was no issue between Republicans and Democrats in seeing the importance. Um, and I think that uh, at this point, if there was congressional leadership and there was White House leadership, Republican, Democrat, House and Senate on the one side, and and uh, the Biden White House. I think I think we could move forward really effectively. Um, so I'm I'm uh, hopeful that a champion will emerge on the Hill, one or more champions, and that the message can be carried um, uh, by coming from Congress uh, to the White House that there is an actually new option for all the things that this White House wants to see happen. So fingers crossed. And a, another good sign is it appears that the different agencies that do have something uh, you know, going on on the technology level are talking to one another. 
in trying to basically bureaucracies do not like to be surprised. OK, so if there's any danger of there being any executive branch or legislative branch guidance coming down the pipe, they want to they want to have answers uh, with respect well, to uh, Gary, forgive me, forgive me. When this happened in the 90s and space solar power and, uh, and the whole approach that is now the common approach, i.e. modular systems and automated assembly. The only bad thing that happened out of all of that is that five or six years later, I got fired. So that was a, that was not a hard price to pay. So I don't mind surprising the bureaucracy as long as it's in a good cause. Uh, I, I agree. Um, you know, and uh, you, 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 you heard it for, from someone uh, that ca you know, came from the, you know, the, the thick of them there, Woods, uh, okay, uh, that knows it well. Uh, you know, and I've certainly been no no stranger uh, to it. Uh, but uh, you know, it's you know, uh, I uh, you know, it's you know, at the risk of invoking a Star Wars analogy, you know, there still may be some good in the agency. <laughs> Very good. Let me get to a number of questions that came in the Q and A. I, Carl actually has asked quite a few questions, and. Uh, but uh, his first question kind of ties into his second question. Uh, how high, how large, and how many could there be? And of course, how can you avoid uh, the orbital congestion problem? Right. So may I, Gary? Sure. OK. So please. typically for, for large-scale terrestrial energy, um, space solar power systems are envisioned as being deployed in a geostationary or a geosynchronous Earth orbit. If you uh, contemplate a geosynchronous Earth orbit rather than geostationary, so that's the, the 36,000 kilometers up, but not necessarily in an equatorial orbit, there's a huge amount of volume of space that's available for solar power satellites. So there's no question but that, um, there's easily enough room for hundreds to thousands of satellites. And if each one is on the order of two to 4,000 megawatts, then terawatts of power could be delivered. And if it's done in conjunction with terrestrial energy, like solar, wind, nuclear, hydro, and so on, then the uh, by by providing a dispatchable uh, source of energy in space on the order of a terawatt in total capacity, it enables stupendously more terrestrial carbon net zero power. Very good. Let me get another question that came in. Uh, this one comes from Randy. Uh, can we talk about how much more efficient solar power from spaces and higher latitudes versus ground-based solar as being, you know, as being a, as well as being an ideal source of baseband power? Base load, base load. Oh, okay, base load. Okay, it looks like it's a I'm, base I'm sure that I'm sure that's what. Maybe it's base that. load. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, the reality of the situation is is that in the in the United Stand United States, for example, okay, right now in Mid Atlantic, uh, the Mid Atlantic region, it's more or less a wash between installing, you know, solar as a uh, as an economic choice versus an aesthetic one. Okay, as you go to higher latitudes, it becomes, um, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, less and less. Uh, you know, cost effective. Okay, as you're, you know, uh, as the weather, you know, in, you know, if you're in southern Arizona, okay, I'm sorry, <laughs> oh, anything you can do uh, is, you know, is, is going to be wonderful in those regards. Okay, if you're, uh, you know, in, in Maine, uh, or for we that matter, even New York, good luck. Or else I've lost me. <laughs> I saw you. Okay, uh, I would just say uh, 40 to 50 to one. Oh. 
nice, nice, simple number. Right. It's it is it is an enormously high leverage, and in the winter time, it can be a hundred to one hundred and fifty to two hundred to one. It is particularly if you're going to have if you're looking at um, weeks of bad weather in winter. Yeah. Maybe this question ties into it. And this one actually comes from, from Fred. And it, it is uh, this one is, is to you, John, but uh, Gary, welcome your comments too. How do you counter the efficiency argument of Elon Musk against space solar power? He says, in essence, why not just put the solar power, solar panels on the ground? Yeah, this is this is of course closely related. The the simple answer is that the numbers that Elon articulated at that moment a decade ago were just wrong that that you know if you're if you include weather and you include the seasons terrestrial renewables are there sometimes and then sometimes they're not there for weeks not hours and so it's uh, um there's just a there's such a huge variation it's not a question of Every day is an average day. Every day I'll have 12 hours of daylight and 12 hours of nighttime, which is kind of the essence of what, of, of what Mr. Musk said. Rather, it's at the best day in June, you might have 12 and 12. But at the worst day in December, you can go six weeks with no sun. So it, it really is... Um, um, it's a, it is a, um, a fallacious argument. I don't want to say specious because it's based on certain assumptions, but, it, but it's not correct. Yeah, it's real simple. Um, if you go through and look at the pictures that are readily available of the so-called solar insulation, basically how much sunlight actually reaches the ground in different areas integrated for an entire year. Uh, it's as I was alluding, you know, if you're at the um, uh, the the, uh, uh, the the latitude of southern Arizona or it's complement in the southern hemisphere, um, you know, hey, it's great, okay. But as you go north or south, you know, from there, uh, it increasingly becomes um, uh, you know a uh, you know a more of an aesthetic choice than uh, you know anything that makes uh, sense economically. Very good. Let me get a few more that have come in. And I hope I'm reading this one right. This comes from Jeff. Uh, can you describe the differences between space solar power alpha and is it Cassiopeia concepts? Is that, it's, am it's, I saying it's, that right? It, it's Cassiopeia. Uh, so, so essentially, uh, Cassiopeia is, um, a, a SPS alpha is solar power satellite by means of arbitrarily large phased array. That's my invention. I looked at it in a NIAC study with NASA uh, some 12 years ago. Cassiopeia is a UK concept. Um, probably the, the, um, they both involve uh, reflectors and uh, a, an array for the conversion of reflected sunlight into electricity and then RF energy, which is then transmitted to Earth. The biggest distinctions between the two are probably that the Cassiopeia concept, as it's currently framed, requires a single one or two or three kilometer diameter, perfectly flat mirror. And that's really, really hard. Versus SPS Alpha that involves a large, uh, array of adaptive optical reflectors that are independently pointed and steered. So Cassiopeia tries to achieve with no moving parts a single reflector that's like a couple of kilometers across, and that is so hard, versus an adaptive optic solution, which is really, frankly, easy. And it's been done for years in, in big telescopes everywhere. Second, Cassiopeia is perpendicular to the orbital plane. 
So the reflectors are up here and down here, just gesturing with my arms. If you've got the, if you can see my 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 picture, my image, um, and therefore it is dynamically unstable. It's like a pencil standing on its point. It it constantly wants to tip. Uh, SPS alpha is um, a gravity gradient stabilized structure with the uh, transmitter on one end and the reflectors, this array of adaptive reflecting optics on the other end. And so it's, it's in, inherently stable, like holding a string. So uh, SPS alpha is inherently stable, uses adaptive optics. Cassiopeia depends on perfect optics and is dynamically unstable like an egg sitting on a pointy end. Gary, any additional things to add on your end? No, no, that, uh, you, know, uh, you know, that ends up, um, you, know, uh, you know, driving the point home, I think. Right, okay. Uh, let me take another question that came in during registration. And uh, uh, it's not a technology question, but uh, uh, there's always this aspect when you're talking about technology itself. Critics say space solar power can be easily weaponized. Uh, are they wrong? Yes. Yes. And the <laughs> part of uh, you both uh, agree on yeah, that. Part it, of, is that part, yeah. The in part basically, uh, you know, in one of the things, you know, in order to make space solar power work, it has to be a cooperative, uh, you know, to to achieve, uh, you know, the alignment that we want with respect to the beams. Get everything. Uh, together, it requires uh, you know cooperation between you know the the source and the target. It you know well, uh, they and that uh, that control link, if you will, if that's if it's not present, there you know your 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 beam is uh, you know uh, going to go to fuse or uh, or go off. Okay, there is uh, there is a a path where uh, the world is you know, going to evolve in a geopolitical sense that could enable different frequencies and different approaches to things, but we're not, you know, we're not there yet and no one's advocating, um, you know, from a civilian perspective for anything like that. Um, I did have an interesting opportunity. I got to speak um, at the, uh, you know, directed energy uh, you know, a uh, symposia forum, uh, you know, to a collection of uh, folks in the audience that would make Marvin the Martian proud. They build, uh, you know, death rays for a living. And uh, I asked them, you know, hey, uh, you know, is what we're talking about, you know, something that, that, that has a gotcha or doesn't make sense that we're just not aware of? And um, interestingly enough, their response was, Absolutely not. But furthermore, they would love to understand how one could make use of, uh, you know, lower power density, you know, you know, beaming capabilities, um, you know, to, uh, uh, you know, more effectively, you know, be able to, um, you know, test things because it's, the physics is the same. It's quite agnostic as to how you use it. So just John, anything just, else? Yeah, just very quickly. So the the most viable options for space solar power are all weather. They're wireless power transmission schemas that can pass through clouds, fog, rain, precipitation, and those tend to be in the microwave regime. The systems that are the most likely to be weaponizable are very high energy density wireless power transmission schemas that would use, for example, lasers. Those don't pass through cloud. So <laughs> if you're developing a civilian commercial system, doing anything in terms of a high power density weapon is extraordinarily difficult and easy to see so no one right. it wouldn't be a secret to anybody everybody would know uh and so uh, and so basically in general what i said before was can it be weaponized no right 
that uh, that was really good. I uh, brought out some really good points. Let me ask a, another question that came in, and this kind of talks about the the impact. Uh, I know a lot of uh, astronomers have already commented on the, the impact of all these internet uh, constellations that are being sent up into space. Uh, is there a downside for astronomers with space-based solar power? Because we'll will block their views. So um, the answer is not as bad as the Leo constellations. This is like the the issue between a fly sitting on your glasses versus an elephant at a hundred meters. The the fly on your glasses is is going to be a much bigger obstruction than an elephant at a hundred meters, even though the elephant is bigger. So one the the solar power satellites in GEO are much, much larger, but they're much less um, obstreperous in terms of terrestrial telescopes. But more importantly, the ability to build kilometer scale arrays is going to completely transform astronomy. The idea that we would be happy with a, a six or seven meter diameter optical system for $10 billion, i.e. the James Webb Space Telescope, as wonderful as it is, 15 years from now, that'll be completely passe because it will become possible to build extraordinarily large optical systems from the visible to the, to the, to the far RF, uh, in higher frequencies as well. Um, it's all these, the, the ability to make these big systems, which will be affordable because of space solar power is gonna be completely revolutionary for astronomy. Bottom line is you can make electro optical interferometry real. Okay. And aperture isn't everything in astronomy, but it's an awful lot. And you know we're uh, you know the you know, the, the tech uh, that we'll be bringing to the table would be enabling for that. I think John, Ed, the other question I see here, I think you mentioned this already, but does does weather on Earth uh, affect the receiving power? Yeah, and the answer is, is very simply: if you choose the frequency well, i.e., between about uh, uh, one and ten gigahertz, or between about two and 12 centimeters, so about, about the size of your hand, absolutely not, no problem. So it just, it just, it's a question of choosing the right frequency for the wireless power transmission. Yeah. Okay, I saw a couple in questions in the chat. Let me just get to those so I can move around a little bit. Uh, looks like a question from Damien. Uh, will space solar power require the use of in-space resources, such as moon metals, as Gerald, as Gerard O'Neill suggested, or from near-Earth asteroids? If so, does this mean major use of space solar power has to wait until we begin to industrialize cis lunar space? No, it doesn't have to wait. And we would go through and the initial systems would be built. Uh, built from the earth, and if it came down to it, they could all be built that way. But the reality of the situation is, is that we should do what ends up making sense, which is transition to being able to make use of extraterrestrial resources as soon as the opportunity presents itself. Yeah, and I would, I would even go just slightly farther. Um, it's a, it's a win-win relationship because without the availability of very large scale, affordable energy, we're not developing the resources of space. Right. And without the resources of space, we're not gonna deploy gigawatts, sorry, terawatts of space solar power. So, so it's, a, yeah. it's a very uh, strong positive feedback loop. Having megawatts of power in cislunar space at an affordable price enables space uh, resources to be developed. The availability of space resources allows space solar power to scale up to terawatt scale. Indeed. 
And kind of two questions at once. Uh, Larry asks a question, and then I'm going to tie that into a question that was submitted. Uh, how can the power generated be protected from rogue users that do not help pay for the infrastructure? But uh, a, a tie-in question with that is, you know, what worrying about uh, hackers and bad players as well is, you know, I think anything that's connected to uh, uh, an internet can can be, you know, can be exposed. But uh, uh, what are your thoughts on this? You want to go first, Gary? That's why I was pointing it. Yeah, that's why I was pointing out the need for the control links uh, and the fact that you have to have, uh, you know, a, a cooperative, uh, you know, transmitter and a cooperative receiver. Uh, essentially, you're setting up a trusted link, and in the uh, when when a trusted link is not available, you, there isn't a beam. Yeah. Uh, so, so the um, in terms of the engineering of it, um, the um, most of the space commercial space solar power systems that have been studied, not all, but most of them involve what's called a retrodirective phase control system. The systems are relatively light. They're relatively floppy. You need a pilot signal from the ground, from the receiver, in order to create a coherent transmission that goes to and only to the location from which the pilot signal came. Now, when you build in to that system additional safeguards, such as encryption, which is not hard, um, you, can you can essentially guarantee that minus a, a truly stupendous level hack, because there will be hundreds of thousands of individuals that you should be able to guarantee no one can use the power unless they paid for it. The reality of the situation is, is that, you know, the, uh, uh, the, the receiving stations will be tied into the terrestrial grid, uh, you know, for distribution purposes. Uh, and, you know, as a consequence, you know, that, you know, that's how it ends, you know, um, you know, well, you know, it would you know, make make use of that, and you know what it does afford though is opportunities. Uh, there's an awful lot of electrical grid work that requires significant modernization, uh, and you know, being able to uh, you know leverage uh, you know the uh, uh, that to um, you know uh, you know apply. Uh, be able to provide for appropriate siting of receiving antennas and, you know, it, it basically, um, you know, recasts the whole notion of what's known as wheeling power, which is, you know, how uh, the uh, integrates, uh, you know, shift power uh, from, from a generation site to uh, where uh, a portion of a grid where it's needed. Um, typically, it's about 400 miles is the limit. These days, you're, there's fancier ways of getting past that, okay? But um, you know, it uh, it it drives up uh, it drives up your uh, you know cost and complexity, uh, you know uh, you know quite a bit when you try um, and uh, you know push push power further. Let me go to a question that uh, Morris put in. It's kind of interesting. Uh, assuming we overcome all of the societal and economic challenges. And we can move forward with building SSP. Uh, if automated and robotic assembly is the way forward, how do large space settlements justify their existence? You know, how does near zero human workers lead to, you know, to, to colonies or settlements? Interesting perspective. So the so this is this is a reference back to the the vision of what would be the economic model for space settlements in the 1970s, uh, I think that in this era of exceptionally low cost launch about to drop again by another factor of five to 10, that there are so many economic models for space settlements that a bigger question is, how could such settlements ever occur unless 
the cost of electricity is yes. pennies per kilowatt hour. If the cost of electricity is five or ten dollars a kilowatt hour, and by the way, the cost of electricity on the International Space Station is on the order of twenty-five to fifty dollars a kilowatt hour, space settlements are never going to happen. We are it is absolutely enabling for space settlement to have very, very low cost megawatt level power. Um, so, and I think there's more than enough um, uh, market for affordable space settlements um, that, uh, that, the, that it's, it is no longer necessary to envision such settlements being somehow enabled by construction workers, blue collar workers. Now, there is also the situation where, uh, you know, as we develop uh, shared control capabilities, uh, you know, having uh, having workers in the, the you, know, uh, you know, much closer vicinity of a um, of a of an assembly area, uh, you know, or, uh, you know, or a more developing how that, you know, best happens in terms of the bridge between teleoperation uh, versus shared control versus, uh, you know, automated operations. There's clearly, you know, a, a role that people are going to play, you know, in, um, you know, in this puzzle. Uh, and it's all part of the, um, you know, broader uh, extension of our, um, you know, uh, you know, economic to, um, uh, you know, to, to Leo and Cislunar space in general. Very good. We are getting close to our end time, and I want to just try to wrap things up with some questions that have come in. So we've talked about what space solar power is. We've talked about the, the technological and uh, economic issues that have been obstacles uh, and that remain. We've talked about environmental. We talked about militarization and uh, uh, and you know, and societal issues related to it. So now that we've done all that, I'd like to maybe ask you each. And these are again based on questions that were submitted. What's your prediction? Do you, we, you know? Do you do you have an estimate of when we might see the first operational space solar power system? Uh, and you know, where do you see it over the going progressing over the next twenty five to to fifty years? So. I can ask each of you that question. John or, or Gary, who wants to go first? <laughs> well, I'll, I'll Gary, go first. Gary, you first. Okay, sure. Uh, you know, in the in the near term, what I think we're going to see, um, and we're beginning to see now, are space to space, uh, you know, venue, uh, you know, demonstrations, uh, you know, extending to surface to surface applications on the um uh you know on the moon uh there's going basically what we have to do is reduce the systems engineering of power and ancillary services beaming to practice to uh you know on a terrestrial basis if you have an electrical power load you've got a power quality spec in a distance uh, you know, from your uh, power generation source. With that information, you can go to a wire gauge table that tells you what kind of material, what kind of wire you can use, how far, <clears throat> how what the distance has to be, what your circuit breaker uh, needs to be on it, and any derating that's required for the environment. Okay, we need whether or not you're talking, uh, you know, microwave, millimeter wave, you know, IR up through iSafe optical. We need to be able to reduce the systems engineering of fieldable, uh, you know, you know, technologies in those areas to practice, and that's what I think what we're we're going to see, uh, and that, uh, and in in addition to that, you know, we're going to see a geopolitical alignment that you know, uh, you know, centers on the fact that there's something real uh, that can be done in the space to earth stuff, and the uh, the, the challenge is. You know, can we um, uh, can we work out uh, the uh, systems engineering and the uh, the economics of it to build the 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 most viable systems 
going forward on that. And I think we'll see that beginning within the, uh, the next 10 years. Okay. Thanks, Terry. John? Um, I think that space, well, space solar power is already here. Um, if you look at the space solar power system, which is the Starlink constellation, it's between 10 and 20 megawatts of space solar power driving an RF power system that's highly modular already. It just doesn't happen to be physically contiguous. And it, it's taken about three or four years to go from SpaceX converting one of its uh, um, launch vehicle factories to it's now making Starlinks. So I think establishing a readily available standard, beginning the manufacturing and all of that, it's four or five years. It, you, you, you allow for some technology innovation and for some solving of uh, assembly problems and so on. It's five to seven years. And, and I, I really believe that the system, that the competition, the race to space solar power, which has already started, is going to result in enormous space solar power systems being developed and deployed by Japan, by China by Europe, by the UK in the next six or seven years. There is, it is, there is just no barrier in the physics or the engineering. It's all in the architecture and the design and the construction. And so um, it is, um, it's gonna be a really remarkable decade with the advent of multi-megawatt affordable space power by others in cislunar space and the US having the launch vehicles during I was during just at least ask the next that. decade. Yeah, because it's during at least this next decade. Yeah. Right. So it's gonna be it's gonna be in, enthralling. And and deep and unless the US gets into the game, deeply troubling. It's so it's it, you both offer kind of a, an optimistic view, but also kind of a scary view that we're going to be left behind. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Well, very, very good. Thank you so much, uh, Gary and John. It was a really uh, interesting discussion. I hope our audience uh, learned a lot. I sure did. I found it very fascinating. So I do appreciate uh, your your contributions tonight and your and especially your expertise and knowledge in this area. It made it, it made it a lot of fun to have this discussion. So, so again, thank you both for taking the time out to be part of this space forum. Uh, as always, I, like, I wanna thank my colleagues, Larry Ahern, uh, our Vice President of Chapters and Fred Becker, uh, who, all, who supports us technically on these space forums. We couldn't do it without both of you. Uh, thank you both for doing that. And what I wanna do now is just share my screen real fast. Uh, and uh, just close out the evening. There we go. Okay, okay. And again, I thank again I thank our speakers Gary Barnhart and John Mankins. And so for everyone who joined us tonight, uh, again, thank you so much for attending. Uh, we hope you enjoyed it. Hope you learned a lot. So wishing you a great evening for those in our time zones. I know we always get a number who are in tomorrow's time zone. So have a great day ahead. And of course, have a great weekend coming up and stay safe. We'll see you again on April 13th uh, for our town hall on the ISDC. So look for the announcements. So everybody wishing you a, a great evening, a great day, and we'll see you next time. Take care. Thank you so much. Take care.